So thanks to everyone joining us today. Uh, we are glad that you can take our time to be with us uh, on this uh, really, really uh, important and uh, opening training session uh, in our series, in our Disarming Disinformation uh, Global Summit. And um, irrespective of where you are joining us from, I'm really always happy uh, that you are able to uh, take our time uh, to be with us today. Uh, my name is Paul Adepoju and I'm the Community Manager uh, for the ICFJ's uh, Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. And uh, this initiative uh, brings together journalists, thousands of journalists from across the world. And uh, we actively engage you uh, with different tools, skills, and uh, eye-opening sessions. So uh, last week, we had a keynote session uh, to officially open uh, the Disarming this Information Global Summit, uh, which is aimed at empowering journalists, content producers, uh, fact checkers, and other key players uh, in this uh, ecosystem on what they need to do, the skills they need to acquire, and the capacity they need uh, to be able to actively contend with and confront overcome and disarm disinformation. And today is uh, the opening session uh, with, uh, with a really good uh, training session on videos. And you would agree with me that um, we've had such previous sessions on how on the trends in journalism. And uh, you will agree with me that multimedia journalism is here to stay. And across different platforms, uh, the people are always interested in watching videos. And videos can actually be a very powerful tool uh, to, uh, to drive this information and, of course, to combat uh, this information. And um, I've personally, too, I've experimented. I've tried my hands on putting videos together. Uh, you know, we will understand the idea. The stress that goes into putting your idea together, uh, filming it, editing, packaging for publishing, and that the disappointment that comes uh, when these videos are not performing really, really well. And I'm really happy that we have an expert uh, that will be joining, that is joining us today uh, to take us through what needs to be done. I'm talking about, I'm being joined today by uh, Jacob, uh, who is from uh, the Thomson Reuters uh, Foundation. Uh, he's a video expert uh, and uh, he's well versed on this, uh, in this conversation and especially in this ecosystem. Jacob, how are you doing today? And thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's great to see uh, so many people from all around the world here. Yes, uh, like uh, like Jacob rightly said, we are joined by people from across the world, and uh, we always like to know where you are joining us from. So some are already doing that, and uh, some that are yet to do that. Please use the chat box uh, to tell us where you are from, uh, your name, your country you are reaching out, uh, reaching us from, and uh, we are glad that you can join us today. And uh, if you're also watching this live stream on Facebook, we know there are some parts of the country where part of the world where uh, uh, there's restricted access to Zoom. So we are also streaming live on Facebook in our forum. Uh, you can use a chat box, the comment box below this video to actively engage with us so that we can also know where you are joining us from. If you have specific specific questions that have to do with how you are doing your thing and um, that you believe that you need immediate and direct response on, uh, please and please do not hesitate to use the question and answer Q and A option on the Zoom platform or the comment box under this video that you're watching right now uh, to let us have those questions so that when Jacob is done with this presentation, uh, we can take as many questions as we want. Uh, so that said and done, I would like Jacob uh, to take the reins of the screen and uh, share the screen and take us through that awesome presentation you have ready for us. Okay. Um, and, and can you guys see my screen? Everything's? Yes, yes, okay. everything. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, the, the topic of this uh, presentation is, uh, it's called, you know, tips for creating viral video content. Um, but I, I kind of like this subheading a little bit better, videos that resonate with audiences and drive engagement, because I think um, as we'll get into, you know, virality is, is something that's kind of hard to define, and it's it's something that can be quite subjective. Um, and and you know, it it 
often should not be the, you know, the be all end all goal of what you're doing. Um, but I think it's really, um, it's really good to talk about, you know, what kind of things you need to do to make sure that the videos that you're making uh, can reach, you know, as wide an audience as possible. Um, so here's how I'll kind of break down the presentation today. I'm going to introduce myself and uh, talk a little bit about what what this mean, what it means to go viral, what it, what exactly that you know, that, that terms me, means and, and how, how to measure it. Um, and uh, then I'm going to talk about um, three things that I think that everyone can, can do to optimize their own videos, their own work to, to reach lar the largest audiences possible. Um, I'm not going to talk about what kinds of videos you need to make. Uh, and uh, because, you know, you, you all work for places and, and news organizations and, and various places, you all have your own creative um, agency and, and know what, what you want to create. Um, what I'm going to go through today is really about um, how to take, you know, how to think about ways to make sure that, that um, you know, you're reaching audiences with those videos and that you're measuring things properly. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some tips and some things that I've learned along the way uh, in my career. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I uh, started off uh, in the business about 15 years ago as a video journalist. Uh, this is a photo of me. Uh, this is probably, you know, one of the high points of my career as a video journalist here, getting strapped to some sort of... Um, tiny airplane where I, I was this was before the the age of drones um or cheap drones so uh this is how i got overhead shots of a deforestation in indonesia on a reporting trip there about uh 13 or 14 years ago um and so much of the first part of my career was not necessarily doing things as exciting as this but basically going out into the field and shooting video um, reporting and producing stories. I worked for uh, Time Magazine for five years. And um, since then, I've published um, videos uh, for the New York Times, for Retro Report, Scientific American, PBS, and Quartz. Uh, at Quartz, um, I, I uh, was a manager there um, and a senior part of the video team there. And um, was there for five years and so grew the basically grew helped grow the the quartz video team from scratch there um and we experimented with all different kinds of videos from explainers to documentaries to social videos and now i'm at the thompson reuters foundation where i'm doing something very similar i have a digital video team and we're primarily publishing on youtube um and focusing on explainers and short documentaries and we publish videos around our our main areas of, of focus, which is climate, um, technology and society and inclusive economies. Um, and then I have some teaching background. I've, I've, I've been teaching a class at, at Columbia University for a number of years, and I've, I've worked with ICFJ uh, a number of times in the past, um, talking about things like this and, and various video uh, production um, aspects. Um, I've also made some some uh, quote unquote viral videos in my time, and um, you know I, they're not necessarily the videos that I've put the most work into, or that I would be you know the most. Um, they're not the most in depth videos, some of them, but the but this is a cross section of the kinds of videos I've worked on in various at various places and various aspects of my career that have, you know, I would say, I could safely say have gone viral. Um, the first one here is the, um, I was working on the social video team at the New York Times when um, the United States pulled out of Afghanistan and everybody probably can recognize this very famous video shot of, of um, Afghans chasing after, um, you know, one of the Air Force planes leaving the country. And um, so I was part of a team that kind of put together and 
put that out online very quickly. Um, this other, this second video here is a, uh, a short video I put together when I was at Quartz about drone racing. And it's if for people who don't know, it's this um, sport where basically people, well, it's a pretty self-explanatory. It's people race drones, um, but they can see through the drone, through the first person view of the drone. So it creates some really amazing video. And I, this was a video that took off on Facebook. And then the third video here was an interview that we did with Bill Gates at Quartz. And I'm including it here because it was published on YouTube and it did it did very well for us on YouTube. Um, and um, and so it was one of our, our big viral hits on YouTube. And, um, and so this was, I'll talk a little bit more about these in a second here. Um, but first, I, I just want to talk about um, a pretty, you know, uh, a, a fair question. I think that's that's really hard to answer. Um, but I think that there's probably, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've learned about what makes something go viral or what makes something resonate with audiences. Um, the first thing is is is, is a pretty um, basic kind of understanding of what virality means which really is you know it's basically like the the popularity of a video that is that that is is gaining in popularity quickly due to the fact that people are sharing it um and and engaging with it and so usually when something goes viral it's a combination of a number of different things happening at the same time so it's people you know it's people liking the video or disliking the video, even as people sharing it um, with others, you know, through different social media or through email, it's people posting it on Twitter and retweeting it. It's people engaging more deeply with other types of content that you're producing, like subscribing to your channel or commenting on the video. Um, it obviously, you know, all of these things lead to more views. And as you know, in most of these places, the, as the algorithm kind of works, is the more engagement you get, the more your video gets surfaced to other people. And so, um, you know, another metric uh, that that's happening here is is watch time too. So if people are really staying engaged with your video for a long time, it's it's bumping it up in the algorithm, and it's more likely to be put in front of more people. And so all these things kind of working at once can really set a video, um, you know, loose on the internet, basically. Um, so what are the, you know, what are the things that that can kind of, it, within the video itself that can be, um, you know, something that, that makes it more likely to go viral. These are just some of the things that I kind of, that popped into my head um, as I was thinking about, you know, especially in, in the news business, like what are the kinds of things that um, can have created or have been part of vi videos that have, have reached really large audiences. Um, one of them I think is kind of the, the big one. It's one that a lot of us recognize in all of the video, all the stuff we engage with online is, is it emotionally resonant? You know, did it make you, did it make you laugh? Did it make you cry? Did it make you angry? Did it make you inspired? Um, often, you know, if you can emotionally connect to somebody, they're more likely to share it. Um, things that are identity driven or issue driven, you know, people share and, and engage with videos when they can relate to the issue or the person or the, the topic, you know, or the, or it's part of, they consider it part of their, their identity. Um, you know, if something's visually stunning, uh, video is, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's a, a huge part of what drives videos to get shared is, is just the wow factor of some things. Um, are they timely? So the closer that you can, especially, you know, as I'm, I'm, Sure, I'm talking to a lot of folks who are in news organizations here who do work on breaking news. And the quicker you can get stuff out, the closer you can get stuff out to when it happens, the more likely it is that people are going to engage with it and people are going to watch it. Um, and then, you know, I put exclusive um, slash access. Um, you know, it's, if you have something that nobody else does, uh, then that obviously, you know, 
means that you're the place that people will come to for it and it can drive traffic. Um, so just looking back on three of the videos uh, that went viral that I played a part in, um, you know, you can kind of see, you can kind of connect some of these things to these videos. Like um, certainly uh, the, the Afghanistan, the Kabul airport, video, um, you know, it hit a lot of these things. It was timely, you know, it was emotional. Um, it was, you know, it was certainly like connected to um, a lot of emotion and a lot of, you know, people, uh, people's politics and, um, and, you know, there was, there was the only thing it really didn't have was exclusivity because this video was, was everywhere. You saw it all, you know, online, but I think, you know, to a certain extent, extent that timeliness kind of plays into the exclusivity part of it and that we were one of the first places to get it up, um, and out there. Um, and then, you know, again, this kind of, uh, shock value of just the video itself was like, Oh my goodness, you know, it was it was a vi striking visual spectacle. And that, and same with the, you know, the drone racing was really the same thing. It was, it was just visually very striking. And we were the only place that had this particular footage. And then with Bill Gates, you know, it was the exclusivity part of it. You know, Bill Gates, he he's he's not like, you know, he he does interviews, but I think it was, he doesn't do a ton of them. And we had him talking specifically on reading and how he reads books, which was like kind of an unusual question that just, I think combined with that, nobody had ever really, I think asked him that or talked to him about that combined with the fact that I think there's a lot of people who identify as avid readers. And, you know, I think there was just, it, it struck a chord. And I think people were just really fascinated to hear what um, his tips for, for how he reads books. Um, and then, you know, of course, the internet is a, is a wild place and anything can go viral. And sometimes all the rules are th thrown out the window. And um, this video is just bizarre. And I don't think necessarily, you know, checks any boxes, but, you know, 438 million people watched it. So... It kind of goes on like that. Um, I mean, it's funny. I guess it does make it, it is funny, but it's it doesn't really evoke. You know, I wouldn't say it necessarily evokes any strong emotions. Um, <clears throat> so that's, and, you know, my point with that is that, you know, it's it's really hard to pin down sometimes exactly what make you know what makes something take off. Um, and then another caveat I just kind of wanted to point to is that there, you know, th there is really no answer to the question like what is what makes something what is the threshold for virality you know like is it one view like is it is it a million views is it a hundred million views i think because first of all on, on different platforms the views are different you know like the a view on youtube uh, is different than a view on tiktok you know it's a it's it's got i would say you know in a way more value because it it's youtube um, counts of you at, at 10 seconds versus, um, you know, a place like Facebook, which, which counts as at three seconds and it's in your newsfeed and it's auto playing. And so there's all these different metrics for, for virality. And so it's hard to say like what one, uh, you know, what a viral video on one platform would translate to on another platform. Um, it's also different based on what benchmarks you're setting for yourself, you know, like somebody like Mr. Beast is going to have a much higher benchmark for virality. He's going to have a very different, um, number in his head for what a viral video is than somebody from a small news organization who's just starting out and, you know, or you're just growing their YouTube channel. And, and really, I want to, I don't want to, I really want to stress this is that if you're, if, if, if you're trying to reverse engineer virality, it's just, it's going to drive you crazy. Like it's not, 
you know, there are so many other things that you really need to put front and center first before you start thinking about, you know, virality. And that's things like your editorial standards. Like, so, you know, um, you, you're, if, you, if you're, you don't want to obviously lower your editorial standards to try to make something more popular. I mean, we're, we're all journalists here and we understand that. And so, um, you know, there's certain things you have to hold first, you know, your organization's mission. If you work for a news organization that it, where their mission is to deliver breaking news from a particular region to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, you know, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be making prank videos on Facebook, uh, even though those seem to be, you know, big hits, right? You're, you're kind of, you, you want to stay, that's an extreme example, but, you know, you want to stay true to your organization's mission. Um, and, you know, you want to understand what your goals are with your audience. Is, is it, is vi virality isn't necessarily an end goal, you know, is, is it, um, you want is some news organizations are really keen on driving people back to their website. Some are really keen on growing subscriptions or building out their newsletter. Um, and so you want to, um, you know, make sure you're setting a, a really clear picture of what you what you're trying to achieve here with your with a viral, you know, if a video goes viral and and it doesn't lead to a certain it doesn't get you the other metrics that you're trying to get to then it's not really it doesn't really matter um and then of course your storytelling and journalistic instincts you know you're out there telling stories i think there we all have those instincts um and we all know what's a good story and we all know what um is a sound journalistic story and so you know you never want to lose sight of that and in you know in uh in the pursuit of, you know, reaching a large audience or going viral. So what can you do um, to ensure that, you know, your video gets in front of people? Um, and, the, you know, I'm, th there are some things that can set you up for success. And so I'm gonna go through um, th three broad tips now. Um, and um, the first one is uh, understanding the right platform. So this, I would say, you know, is, is something that I've kind of learned over the years working on various different platforms that, uh, you know, you, you really, I think that sometimes, you know, the, the instinct is to kind of create a video and then just put it everywhere. And I think that to a certain degree, depending on obviously on, on resources, you do want to spend time thinking about what those platforms offer, what works on those platforms, why you're why you're on those platforms, and what you're trying to measure on those platforms. So, the first thing you know to think about, I think, is is like um, you know who exactly your audience is or who you're trying to reach, and I think that that's something that. Um, you you know you work in editorial alongside an audience team kind of figuring out who your audience is who you're trying to reach and that can be anything from the you know an age range or particular sex um, profession uh, or you know income level it can be a particular part of the world it could be certain people who are, who are deeply interested in certain topics or who have broad interest in topics and you know specific topics um it could be people who are primarily consuming news on their phone um or it can be people who uh, you know in the video world like you could be trying to go after somebody who who you know only watches 15 minutes of video a day versus somebody who watches three hours and those are very different types of people and it it, it will dictate where you decide to publish and the kinds of stuff, uh, the kinds of um, formats that you decide to publish um, your videos with. So I think um, once you kind of have a sense of who you're trying to reach, then I think you can start to look at the different platforms and understand, you know, what your best targets are. And, and again, I say targets because not everybody has the resources of, of a newsroom that can 
really focus on all of these and really do, you know, understand each of these platforms and do really well on them and have a team devoted to each of them. But you, you know, you kind of want to understand who you're trying to reach. And then based on that, you can, you can look at different platforms and, um, you know, these are just a few kind of things that, um, that I, you know, I've pulled out about the audiences on these platforms. So Twitter, it's very global. It's generally in kind of all ages. There's not really one specific demographic on there. Um, YouTube, one thing that's interesting that sets it apart is that it's still 30% of people who watch YouTube videos, watch them on a desktop and people are engaged much longer in videos. It's much more of a sit back experience than other social media platforms. Facebook tends to skew older. Um, you know, it's worth pointing out, it's still the most popular social media platform in the world, even though it's not always the buzziest one. Um, Instagram tends to be, you know, more the millennial generation. Um, and, you know, you, I, I went online and looked up where its biggest audiences are. And uh, along with um, the US, it's India, Brazil, Russia, and Indonesia. So sometimes it's really good to know, you know, where that platform is popular. And then TikTok is, um, you know, as we all know, it's, it's very much uh, um, uh, geared toward Gen Z right now. Um, and so once you kind of have an idea of like what the audiences are on the platforms, then I think it's uh, another thing you can um, focus on is what, um, what works well on each platform. And so this is what when we say optimizing, you know, for each platform that I think this is, it's, it's a good thing to kind of understand where the different, um, you, you know, if, if you need to adjust or kind of focus the format or the type of video for per, per platform, I think this is a bit of a over, kind of simplified breakdown of, of some formats and that I think, you know, these platforms tend to work best on these platforms. So as you as you may or may not know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen, you know, social videos on Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter that, you know, are very text on screen heavy. And really that's all because the platform itself, you know, people, most people who are watching videos on those platforms are not watching with sound. I think TikTok's an interesting example because it is, uh, you know, it's similar in, you know, it's vertical video, it's mobile first, but sound is a much bigger part of TikTok than with some of these other social media platforms. And YouTube, of course, um, you know, 16 by nine, the, the kind of HD um, viewing experience is still predominant, but they're getting, you know, they're doing shorts. And so they're starting to get a bit into vertical as well. Um, and then the length varies, you know, I think, um, all th this is all kind of fluid, but I think for now, you know, it's really clear that longer stuff works on YouTube and uh, short stuff, you know, some of this stuff is restricted by the platform itself too. So some of this is, you know, um, under a minute on things like TikTok and in reels on Instagram, I think that, you know, you, you, the shorter can kind of sometimes work better. So does that mean that you should be taking every story that should be 10 minutes and trying to make it a minute? No, but it's helpful to understand and to know what works best on these platforms and to think about that as you're thinking about the kinds of stories that you're doing, the kinds of videos that you're producing. Um, another thing that I, I, you know, recommend doing, although, you know, I wouldn't, it's a, it's a bit of a tricky kind of uh, thing because you're, you know, you, what you want to do is be distinctive. You want to be unique and, and have your own kind of, offering um but i but it's always really helpful to understand to, to find places that are doing things really well uh on uh platforms and and understand what they're doing right and to pay attention to them and maybe they've come before you and they figured things out um you know uh, over time and it sometimes can be really helpful or a nice shortcut to kind of understand um some of the things that they're doing really well um, I think, yeah, speaking of um, um, just, you know, TikTok's a relatively new platform for, for news organizations. So I think a lot of places right now are thinking about TikTok and looking at some of the, uh, you know, the, the early um, 
news organizations that are, are starting to get into TikTok and figuring it out. Um, I, I like the, NP, I think NPR is doing a really good job. Um, After the earthquake, they're making baklava again. This family run store has been making baklava for over 90 years. They had never stopped making baklava, not even during the COVID pandemic. But with the earthquake, they stopped because their employees were scattered everywhere. They were looking for relatives. People were sleeping in their cars. And they said, this is not the time to make baklava. They started making hot soups. They had people come and sleep here in the baklava restaurant and they were delivering medicines. Now they say it's time to make baklava again because baklava is the symbol of this city of Gaziantep. But you know, we met some people here who just spent nine days volunteering, bringing bodies out of the rubble. And they say they came here, they tried to take a bite, but they just couldn't stomach it. So baklava is back, but for some, it's still too early. So, yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's certain things that I think they, they, they do really well. They've got, you know, really clear text on screen. They've got a presenter led. Um, it's, it's timely, it's newsy, but it's got a bit of a twist to it. Um, it's very visual and, uh, you know, very short and concise. And I think there's just, you know, it's always, it's always a good idea to kind of look at people who are doing this already and see, Wow, some of the things that they're doing well and, and can learn from. So next, the next thing I wanna talk about is thinking about how you're measuring success. And, um, you know, beyond, we talk about how these are the elements working together to create virality, but some of these things might be more important to you than others. For example, if you're a news organization that's really interested in engaging with and having conversations with your audience, then comments might be something you're really gearing your videos to try to create, you know? So you see this a lot on YouTube. You see this a lot with, with YouTubers, with like um, people who are like gamers, for example, like you see a lot of um, people really, you know, in the video itself, asking their audience to give them tips or to give them, ask them questions or what kind of video do you want to see next? Um, I think, you know, those are the kinds of things you do if you want um, more comments, for example. But, you know, you have to kind of decide based on your organization's mi mission and, and what you find most important from an editorial standpoint as well. What kind of engagement? How do you want your audience? What's, what's most important to you right now? So that you know the, the total number of views might not be the thing that you're most that's most important for you right now. Obviously, these things all feed into each other, but I think it's really important to think about that first and to set up a system to measure your success on in that in, in the things that you value most. Um, and then there's other metrics beyond engagement too that I think are just worth thinking about as you're publishing videos and that's things like publishing cadence, which you know can really matter. Um, you know, a place like YouTube, for example, like really having a consistent publishing cadence can really help grow a channel. Um, publishing speed if if you're, editorial mission is to deliver videos as quickly as possible. And we know timeliness can play a part in a video's success and how it can reach an audience. Then what is the publishing speed? How quickly are you, are you able to turn around a video and is there ways to improve that? Um, and so that includes things like internal resources. Um, and then, you know, things like monetization, if that's important to you, that, you know, that's a potential other thing to keep track of. And impressions are, you know, just where your video appears in front of people um, and how actively you're able to push that out. So it's a little bit different than kind of something organically um, be, becoming viral is, is, you know, how much your, your organization is able to really push this video out and get it in front of as many people as possible. So, the final thing um, which I've touched on is, is really this idea of, of testing and measuring things and then tweaking things and repeating successes. And I think um, this is really important in terms of getting yourself <clears throat> on a path to, um, you know, to finding what works and then really leaning into that. Um, and so some of the things that I think, you know, you should be testing 
for sure when it comes to videos are things like formats. Um, uh, so when I talk about formats, I'm talking about, um, you, you know, something like a news package versus an explainer versus a character driven uh, film versus a breaking something that's more breaking news or a, te a heavy text on screen social video. Um, it's really important to test those formats and see what your audience, um, you know, it gravitates toward um, and, and really try to become better and better at, at those formats. Um, headlines is another, you know, really important one. Um, it, in the, you know, it's another way to put that is, is how you're framing the video. So it's not necessarily a headline, but it could be the way that you're framing it on social media. The um, the, you know, on social media with when videos autoplay, um, the, the opening of, of the videos is actually part of, it's part of the way that you're framing the video. You know, the first sentence, the first image, the first thing that you're trying to grab somebody with on social media with autoplay, I mean, that's as important as picking a great thumbnail or picking a great headline because, on those platforms, that, that's what's what's hooking people in. So this headline opening thumbnails, they're all kind of be, they're all kind of this singular thing, which is framing. And depending on what platform you're publishing on, you're going to focus more on, you know, you're going to hook people in with a variation of these three things. Um, the topics, I, I think, you know, again, you work for a news organization um, that might have very specific um, pillars of coverage and um, you're not, you know, you're not necessarily um, trying to break from your editorial guidelines or your mission, but you're experimenting as much as you can within that, you know, of, of what are the kind of topics or the things that people might be interested in. Um, and then, you know, characters, for example, um, are do you, are you featuring a character early on in your story versus later? Um, or do, or do you do you like is your audience connecting with the with uh, character driven stuff or stuff that features people um, voices on the ground more than something that's you know from a studio or an, or presented like in an explanatory format. So these are other, you know, things to think about. What kinds of characters are your audience resonating with? Um, and then calls to action is, you know, the things that I, I had mentioned a, a bit earlier about, <clears throat> you know, if you're, if you're interested in comments, um, you know, how do you get people to comment? You know, and this is, how do you, if you want, if you want people to subscribe to your channel, how do you, what, what is the language you're using to get, your viewers translated into whatever form of engagement you're interested in uh, growing. So, and then I, here are just kind of ways that you can measure that. When we're talking about uh, when we're talking about testing. We're obviously talking about measurement and and looking at data. And so, um, with something like format, some of the things you want to pay attention to are watch time. Watch time is a really important metric on YouTube specifically. But I think on all platforms and as video creators and storytellers, I think it's probably one of the most important metrics personally that we're looking at because it's really what it's saying is, are you telling a story in a way that's keeping people hooked? Are you, you know, or are there better ways to tell that story? Um, so watch time is a really key one, you know, to pay attention to. Um, views, obviously, with formats, um, you know, if you're seeing that explainer, your explainers are doing much better than your breaking news videos, then, you know, just more people are watching them, you get a sense, okay, there's more interest here in this kind of format. And, you know, subscribers is another one. It's one thing to get a lot of views. It's another thing to create something where people watch it and say, oh, I like this enough. And I like all of this enough to subscribe to the channel or, you know, follow on Twitter, or, you know, even, you know, pay, pay to um, the subscribe to the news organization, et, et cetera. Um, so headlines, 
uh, click through rate is is a pretty headlines and thumbnails is our our I think what you're what you're measuring there is did we get did we present this story or frame the story in a way that got people to click on it. And so by tweaking your headlines and your thumbnails, you're focusing on that, that metric. And so it's really, it's, it's nice, you know, for a place like YouTube, for example, which doesn't have um, AB testing, for example, um, you, you, it's you, what you can do though, is, is really like isolate very specific data. So you can isolate your click through rate and and tweak headlines. So like we do that all the time at, at Thompson Reuters Foundation. I do that. I used to do that a lot at courts too, or where, where you know, I look at the click through rate of something, and you know after it's published, we tweak the headline, or we tweak the headline for a week, and then we tweak the thumbnail for a week and see if there's any difference. Um, and so it's constantly kind of coming up with uh, and testing and coming up with different variations of those. Um, and openings again, it's it's about watch time, you know, uh, or if, you know if you're on Facebook, <coughs> Facebook or Instagram, <coughs> views I guess is another metric because if you have a strong opening, people stay uh, lo watching long enough, it counts as a view. So I think your opening, you know, is there's there's a lot of ways to to track whether you've got a strong opening. Um, things like topics, again, it comes to to views, click through rates, and comments. Are you is the content itself engaging people? Are are your audience really interested in this? Um, and then yeah, characters, same thing. You know, watch time, subscribers, likes. These kind of deeper engagement with the content itself. Are are, is, are people? Is it emotionally resonating with people? Are people? Are these characters gripping enough to keep people watching? Um, and then calls to action uh, is also something that I think is very measurable in that um, you can see if, if you decide to focus your call, a call to action, uh, you know, at the end of a video to be something, uh, you know, that gears people to make comments or if even within the video itself, you say, you know, what do you think, you know, if you have a presenter led video, for example, and you say, um, in the video itself, uh, let, let me know what you think in, in the comments below in the video. Um, you can, you can track that and see, you know, did, were, did that particular call to action lead to more comments on that video? Um, and then of course, like, and subscribe, it, it all goes back to what are you trying? What's your, what are your top metrics that you're the, the top engagement metrics that you're focused on? What are the things that you want to create more of with your videos? And then testing ways to, you know, to encourage that kind of behavior. And then the final thing, test, tweak, and repeat. Repeat is a, something that I, I think uh, a place like Business Insider is, is really good at, for example. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, um, you know, once you find a format that works, or once you find a topic area that that really resonates, um, you know, finding ways to repeat that. Uh, and uh, I think th this is, I think, there the insider YouTube channels because there's multiple ones are, are kind of like master classes and how to find and replicate formats that you know the, the important thing is you don't want things to be repetitive or get boring but there's certain formats here that they've caught on to that just um you know broad enough but can but they have a consistent you know what to expect when you click to watch something you know kind of how that five to ten minute video is going to play out but it's brought a broad enough topic where you can do all sorts of different things so like they have this series called refurbished where they basically i mean they refurbish they talk about how something gets refurbished and um you know i think it's sort of like one of those things if you're really into the topic and you really enjoy watching videos like that um and they seem to have found you know big enough audiences that are then they're, then it's a very repeatable format um i'm gonna stop here um and open it up to some questions um because i've been i've been blabbering on for quite some time now 
Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and um, start to answer some of these questions that are already put here in the Q&A. And then, Jacob, um, before you do that, before you do that um, I wanted to catch your breath. For yeah, do that. You need that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me give you seconds to do that. Uh, for our audience, um, we want to do something really quick. And um, so we have, um, I'm putting a link um, in the uh, in the chat box right now. Please click that link, and uh, it takes you to a very short survey uh, that we'd like you to do um, regarding this session. Uh, please quickly do that while Jacob uh, uh, catches his breath. And um, please, um, I'm trying to uh, get you to do that. Uh, I'll always put that link in your face again so I don't miss it. <laughs> It's a very short uh, survey that we want you to do. And um, there are lots of questions already, and I think we'd like to start that. And um, so let's say uh, we, okay. I'm displaying them on my, I would like to display them on my screen, but I still want people to, so 30, 30 more seconds before you, before we start taking those questions. So please click that link again, one more time and, um, quickly help us out with the survey. And um, while that is going on, uh, the first question that I think is quite obvious uh, for Jacob uh, is on the screen right now. So uh, the question goes thus, um, oh, is, okay, would you say that as far as political content is concerned, uh, what makes people hungry has a stronger political potential for virality compared to what makes people happy and optimistic? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it's hard for me to answer because I feel like I've seen really good examples of both of these. Um, yeah, I mean, the pessimist in, in me says that I think it might be, be you know, there is definitely a really strong um, there is a really strong correlation with that sort of hate, hate watching and the things that, you know, I mean, anger is, is definitely one of those really strong emotions that I think, um, you know, can get people really engaged with stuff, I think. But I do think there's just, there's so much, um, you know, I, I think there's so much on both sides, to be honest, that really, um, they both really work. I think, you know, they both, especially with political content, you're, you're talking about things that are, are very much wrapped up in, in your identity and, and, the, and things you feel very strongly about. And so I would say, you know, the, my, my short answer to that is, is that there, there very, there, there could be a, uh, anger could be one of those emotions that, that definitely drives things more than others. But I would say, you know, that um, both are definitely can be drivers of, of virality. I think, you know, sadly, I think what, what often doesn't get, um, doesn't get shared and, and talked about and, and seen as much as, as the kind of, the stuff in between the the stuff that is is a little bit more nuanced or complicated i think you know definitely you know when it comes to social media um what we tend to see a lot of is just the, these really extreme cases of of you know evocative kinds of content that rise to the top whether that's things that people are, are upset about or things that, you know, people want to, you know, strong opinions that people agree with and they want to share. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. No, I would say definitely not. I mean, I think that, um, Again, I think <clears throat> I think that st things that evoke strong emotions or that have a really clear point of view do it is a really it's a strong driver of virality. And so in that sense, again, a news organization, a news 
clip that is very, um, you know, is very neutral in tone and very objective, uh, you know, might not be, it might not uh, be shared as widely as something that has a point of view, but I do think timeliness is a really, I, I, I saw, you know, if you, if you, if you have an audience that is in a really clear um, editorial mission, which I think places like AP and Reuters do. And, um, you know, I, I worked on a social video at the New York Times for a year. And again, same like a built in audience that's very much, you know, has a very clear brand and, and mission. And I think that news, if, if you can get things up in a timely manner and you're kind of building an audience around breaking news that I think that breaking news can work really well on social media. Um, I think on YouTube, it's a bit of a different equation. I don't think people are going on YouTube as much for, so, for breaking news, although I know YouTube is really trying to lean into it. And there's even on, I think I've, I've seen and heard um, from others that there's there's sometimes like a breaking news section on a, on the YouTube homepage when big news happens. And I, I think that they're trying to create the website as a place where people do go for breaking news, but it really isn't. I mean, I think Twitter right now, Twitter is still um, Twitter and then maybe secondary would be, you know, Facebook and Instagram and, and places like that for breaking news, but it's still, you know, we had a really healthy, um, audience on Facebook and Instagram for breaking news at the New York Times. Yeah, the next question, uh, learning a lot about short form videos before becoming the new medium of news consumption. How do we make longer explanatory videos that do well? Yeah, so again, I think it comes back to that understanding of taking, understanding the platforms and taking them seriously. And, um, you know, and if, if it's, if you're looking to make longer explanatory videos, you know, what I would say is you probably want to look at YouTube if you're not already as your primary publishing platform for those. And then, you know, take all the steps that I suggested in terms of understanding the audiences you're trying to reach, understanding who's doing things on YouTube well, um, and, um, and then experimenting with formats and tweaking and, um, and trying and testing. And I think with longer explanatory videos and with YouTube in general, it's a much slower pace of growth um, generally. It's um, then, you know, certainly than TikTok right now, but it would be um, the kind of thing that if you, you have to build that into, you know, certain things into your, your goals and, and be realistic in the growth there and, you know, perhaps pay more attention to things like watch time than to views at the beginning. Um, but I think, you know, that's the place you'd want to do it. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about YouTube right now is that they're really leaning into shorts, um, which, uh, you know, one thing that, that we're trying to do at Thompson Reuters Foundation, and I think um, other places are as well on YouTube is, to establish a format on in a, on the longer end, but also use shorts as something that can help grow that channel. So it can be a combination of the two, um, because you know subscriber growth on YouTube is a really key metric, and uh, it, it's looking like shorts is is also a really as a good way to do that potentially. Um, so I think you know that's that's one way to to look at it. Um, but yeah, I think. Um, you know, and, and the other, the other thing you can do, but I, you know, I wouldn't recommend this as something that's necessarily going to have a huge amount of success driving traffic to your longer explanatory videos. But, um, one thing that a lot of places do is they, they recut stuff for, for social for the, in the shorter formats. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways of thinking about that, um, there's the you could you know think of it as like a trailer for your longer video put it on all these social media platforms and really just explicitly drive try to drive people to the longer video i think what we've seen is that videos on most social other social media platforms 
they tend to do better when they're completely self-contained and when you're actually not trying to drive people to another platform. Um, it's not like, it's not a coincidence. Every platform is trying to keep you on <laughs> their platform. So it's not, it, it makes sense, but it's a tricky thing of, you know, using shorter videos to try to drive people to your longer stuff. But it, it is a, it is a tool. It's, it's something that you should absolutely, everybody should, you know, use every lever at their disposal to try to get people to watch these longer, more nuanced or maybe more complicated pieces of content that, you know, it can be, all, you know, it can be harder to, they're not thrown immediately in front of people. It can be harder to build an audience on. Yes. And um, so please, um, I really want to take a live question. So please, if you want to go live with your question, please raise your hand. And uh, one more, one more uh, request, please do not uh, ignore my, the chat I'm putting there. We really need your thoughts and your perspectives on it. Uh, so please, again, if you've not done so, the link I just posted in the chat box, please go there. We really need you to engage with us. And I've combined two questions uh, for the next session. Uh, for um, So this is what you see uh, when you click that box. And um, please, uh, so for the next question, uh, we have two already that I've combined. Uh, so the first question is, uh, how many videos should I upload per day uh, or week on TikTok? Does that influence the visibility of the videos? And uh, what are your thoughts on cross-posting? Uh, what platforms work well with cross-posts? Yeah. Um, I'm going to inter I'll, I'll go backwards. I'm going to interpret the cross posting question as, um, you know, taking posting a single video to multiple platforms. I think that it's, it's, it's much, there are more platforms now than maybe, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago when I was doing, uh, when we were doing at courts videos on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Um, but I think one thing that's, that's nice from a production standpoint is we're get the, the vertical video seems to be becoming a lot more prevalent. And so um, what's nice is that we've seen YouTube shorts and reels and TikTok. It, you know, you can basically, you, you don't really need to make that many tweaks and you can basically post the same video to three platforms. And they're really, I mean, there are all these places are learning from each other. And so I think that's one area where, you pretty much can, it makes a lot of sense in that, you know, you can make a vertical video. They're all kind of going after the same thing. So when, you know, when I said at the beginning, like, don't just make one thing and put it everywhere. I do think with YouTube shorts, reels and TikTok, uh, they're pretty close. They're pretty well aligned. So you could, you could definitely make one video for all three of those. So I think in that sense, it makes sense. I think I've noticed a lot of news organizations just, you know, due to the fact that, um, you know, not everybody has a ton of resources to reformat things. I have noticed that a lot of news organizations are taking, are prioritizing the vertical. So uh, shorts, TikTok and reels, and then those videos are starting to be put on the on Facebook feeds and Instagram feeds. And so um, I think that, that, you know, shows that, you know, there's probably more priority placed on the vertical um, platforms right now. Um, so I think the short answer is, I think you have to kind of understand where that makes sense. So it, it makes a lot of sense in certain areas. And then you want to understand, like internally, use, do you have, the, is it worth the resources to take this video and recut it for this platform? Um, and so, yeah, that all comes back to, you know, who your target audience is and what you're trying to get out of these. Um, so that is the, that is the cross posting answer. Sorry. Can you pull that question up again, Paul? I forgot the first part of that. Oh, how many videos? Yeah. Cadence. It, it's a really, I, I mean, I, I, I can't say for TikTok. I don't know as much about TikTok as, um, as I do some of the other platforms. So, um, you know, I think um, my instinct would be yes. I mean, generally it is a numbers game on a lot of these places, in a lot of these places. 
the more you upload, the more your stuff gets juiced in the algorithm. I would assume it's the same for TikTok. I know for sure it's it's like that for Facebook and YouTube. So um, yeah, I think you know cadence is important, but again, it comes back to that question of like, you know, you have a limited number of resources. So how are specific goals? Okay, thank you very much. So I want, want to take some live questions. So we have uh, we are going to go back to, back to back. Uh, Mafugi Sise, um, what is the question? Um, thank you so much for the, um, allowing me to ask the question. Um, Sorry, can you speak like that so that we can hear you properly? Can you? I'm saying thank you so much for allowing me to ask my question. You get it, me? Yes, yes, yes. No. Hello. Yes. Right. Yes, I'm saying th thank you um, so much for allowing me to ask my question. Yes, yes. go ahead. In my, yes, in my country, um, in the Gambia, um, we, we were governed at least um, for 22 years uh, by a tyranny government. Um, but for now, uh, the social media, we are back to a, um, a democratic rule, uh, which I'm not so much of our people do really understand. Uh, democratic uh, government, how government, uh, democratic government should operate. Now, um, the tendency now is many of them are using social media um, and misinformation and disinformation is gaining much momentum in the country. So as a journalist, um, this is what I would want to know. How would somebody be able to counter some of these um, disinformations because they are um, widely spread as wildfire, particularly some of them will um, open their WhatsApp uh, group pages where they will be sharing among themselves. So, and we are living in a country that absolutely 95% cannot read neither to write. So this is um, okay. my question. I would like to know how to go about these things either to, and the government also, um, the government we have is um, not proactive, but they are reactive. Okay. They will not only clarify issues at the right time, but then they will only, when the issues unfold already, they will just come and try to clarify, but then this mostly is already the damage has already been done. Okay, so um, this is what I I would like to know how to go by. Okay, thank you very much, Mafu. Yeah. Uh, that we go to Beth. Beth, yeah, the floor was the question. Yeah. Um. So I've worked in media and tech for about two decades now, and I know I'm a freelancer, and I've also worked for major media corporations for years. Um, so my question is, working at big media companies, I know that we have insights into social media platforms that you don't normally do as a freelancer or someone who works in other countries. So my question right now is that like, for example, right now, like what are the most important metrics, say for YouTube, I think it's percent of percent of watching, like what are the big metrics for Instagram and TikTok? How do they suggest content? Do you have any of that insider information that those now on the outside may not know? And do you have suggestions? That's a good question. Um, you, not, uh, you not that uh, I said it's a marathon. <laughs> uh, should I should ask you. Uh, so those next to Annette. Can Paul? Oh, can no. I can oh. I start answering some of these or? Okay. Okay. Then you can take the first two. Yeah, because I'm start. I just want to make sure I don't forget. <laughs> I'm, I can keep two questions in my head at the same time. That's about it. Um, so uh, Mugafi, I would say, you know, to your question about how journalists can counteract disinformation. I mean, I think obviously, you know, we're you know we're limited in our capacity to to compete sometimes with disinformation or misinformation, especially when it's inflammatory. I mean, we know for a fact, I mean, this isn't anecdotal. We know that 
inflammatory content can spreads faster. You know, people want to share things that they want to believe, you know, then that might not necessarily be the thing that's true. I think, you know, there's, there, there's a, a ton we can do, um, you know, to, to, uh, as a, you know, there's a, there's a ton, I think a lot of the, obviously a lot of the responsibility I think falls on social media companies, but as journalists, what we can do is we can be on those platforms where the misinformation is being spread and we can share and, and we can report and share, our, you know, our reporting in a way that we can do all the things that I've been talking about in, in the presentation, which is just put as many resources into trying to get um, our information in front of people. And I think, you know, there's, there's a business perspective and there's an audience perspective, but I mean, Mufagi, it's on, you know, you're operating in a country where there's a, you know, these are real, there, there's some real actual tangible reasons why getting your stuff in front of more people, you know, that it could potentially, you know, save lives. It can potentially be, um, is an actual tool to counteract misinformation that that is very dangerous. So I think, you know, the the thing, the short answer is, is you know, go try to be on those platforms, you know, where misinformation is being shared. I mean, if your news organization, if, if WhatsApp is a place where people are sharing information in your country, your news organization should try to prioritize WhatsApp as a place to to be disseminating your information. If TikTok is a place where, you know, a lot of misinformation is being spread, um, like it is in, in this country right now, you know, then it, I think it, there's, it's more than just an audience question. It's about being in those places and trying to, you know, counteract that, that disinformation. But again, you know, there's, a, there's only so much we can do to fight the, you know, the, the, the human nature of wanting to share things that support the things that they believe. Uh, so yeah, I, I hope that kind of answers your question. It's a really difficult question to answer. Um, Beth, I would say, um, I would say that uh, we're all on the outside. <laughs> Nobody knows how these algorithms work. Uh, I mean, I've talked to people in who work at some of these places who don't really understand how some of these algorithms work and what they prioritize. But I think, um, you know, I could say from what I what I have seen, and 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 the other thing is that they're it's constantly changing. And so there was a period of time where Facebook really valued short stuff, and then they really then all of a sudden we noticed they were valuing really longer stuff, like longer five to 10 minute videos were getting a lot more attention. And it's like almost that thing that you were all on the outside and we're all just trying to understand where the, how these algorithms are working based on very limited information. Um, you know, some of us are places that post a lot of stuff and, you know, might have more data on that, but I think, you know, we're all trying to kind of figure out this. I, um, very broadly speaking though, I think, um, you know, Facebook is definitely still like new news, breaking news clips and um, short text on screen, you know, videos still do really well, I think, on Facebook and Instagram um, and longer um, watch time. And as you said, percentage viewed is a big part of um, of juicing videos and on the YouTube algorithm. I think the thing that I always just try to, try to keep in my mind is every one of these platforms is trying to keep you on there as long as possible. So if you're a place like YouTube, where people people's viewing habits is to turn on a playlist or to watch, uh, you know, an eight minute video on something, then and, and do the dishes or something, you know, I think that they're going to try to surface videos that um, keep people watching longer, uh, you know, in front. And so if you have a video that is people are engaged, you know, a lot of people watch to the very end, that video is more likely to, to be juiced up in the al algorithm. But I think there's just so many, there's so many factors. Um, I think that news is, is still, newsiness does play a factor on YouTube. I can definitely see when things are 
when we have videos that are in the news, um, you know, people, there's, they get surfaced uh, to a greater degree. Um, and, you know, and, and search obviously on YouTube is a, is a huge component of that. So, you know, I think I, uh, um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. So next to Google. Um, and so, you know, it's something to just kind of keep in mind when you're making videos for that, <clears throat> for that platform that a lot of people come and search for things. And so um, being really strong on SEO and, and understanding what people are looking for can play a big part in that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are, um, that's as much insight as I can give you on that. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, like I said, we have a long list of questions, but um, we also want to take some that have been set in already. So, um, so do you see video, uh, any evidence of video format getting more important than written word? Uh, some say that platforms like TikTok drive news audience away from reading and the trend may be here to stay. And a second question, can stories created for social change pass as a means of countering disinformation? Why, why Jacob such answers that? <laughs> <laughs> please, please, and please again, um, requesting there, uh, please do help us with that survey. And um, I just put a link up again, please go. It, it doesn't take up to two minutes, uh, click it and um, let us know um, your thoughts on this. So do you have a response, Jacob? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the short answer to the first question is no. Um, I think what we're seeing is video being used in a lot more different ways than it used to be uh, used online. I think just with technology and products getting better, I think we're seeing a lot more use of like nonlinear video, for example, like video and text and photos all working together uh, to tell a story. I think that's, you know, probably something that will continue to get more prevalent as the technology increases and as technology, you know, the product and technology teams in newsrooms work more closely with editorial and really trying to understand like what the user, best user experience is. I think we're starting to see that develop a lot more than, you know, you know, even five years ago, for example. Um, uh, I think that, um, Certainly video on social continues to become, you know, more and more prevalent. And I don't necess necessarily see that as, you know, a replacement for text, I think. But I, you know, I think that right now TikTok is, is the, is the um, big kind of social media darling. It's the place with, it's got the fastest growth and, it's reaching a much younger audience. Um, and I do think it's important for news organizations to be aware of, of what works on TikTok. And if you can crack into TikTok with news, then I think you're, you know, there's a lot of potential there, but I don't necessarily see that as something that would, you know, replace text. It's just another platform to reach people. But I, I think when it comes down to it, you know, when we're talking about delivering the news, I think really to keep at, at the heart of it is, you know, is in addition to focusing on and understanding what works on the platform to also just keep in mind of when video works and when it doesn't. And so when does it make sense to have video in a story versus, uh, versus text versus photos? And I think um, yeah, I think more the trend I'm seeing is we're seeing more cohesion in all, how all those are working together to create an experience that's like putting the user at the front of it. So, you know, understanding how to use all those things so that if the purpose of your, your visit to, to the homepage of a news organization is to understand what happened in the last 
30 minutes in, in, in Turkey and Syria, then all of those things are working together to give you that in a way that, you know, they wouldn't, disparate versions wouldn't. So I think that's more, you know, what the trend that I'm seeing. Okay, Camilla, you have the floor. Camilla, are you ready to ask the question live? Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, many people argue that uh, CEO categorization is essential on TikTok and that picking up a niche, say lifestyle, cooking, fashion, usually helps to appear on the For You page. So I'd like to know if you agree with it and what do you think that news organizations could do about it? Like news or politics could be considered a niche themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, you take that, or can I add more to that? Samiri, are you ready? Samiri? Aneti, okay. Samiri, you have the floor. Add your question, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, let's start with Samiri, then Aneti. Okay, can you hear me, Paul? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, uh, my question is, uh, we have like, uh, I'm calling from Ethiopia, I'm uh, in East Africa, I'm from Addis. Uh, we have uh, a podcast, uh, a radio program that uh, uh, centers on entrepreneurship and job creation. We don't have much interaction with our videos, with our YouTube videos, but we have like 22% uh, uh, people without jobs. People say they are job seekers, but they don't uh, interact with the uh, programs like ours, uh, the center on entrepreneurship and uh, job creation. What can we do to uh, attract those people, uh, to see our programs, to create jobs? Because most people are like uh, watching any uh, videos that are going viral are mostly entertainment or uh, uh, football, uh, something like that. How can we uh, make our videos that are important uh, viral? Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I think that's a relevant question. We always see people, uh, people that have a problem, but they are still not engaging actively with the content that will solve their problems. I think you can look for like, if you can squeeze in the Neti, and Neti is already on the line. Neti, can you add yours? Yes. Um, hello, my name is Neti Monsha from Zambia. And my question is uh, on identifying or knowing uh, your audience needs, even as you post uh, content, how can we analyze our audience needs and ensure that the content that we are creating or posting um, is in relation to what our audiences are interested in? Thank okay. you. Oh, yes, Jeff. Yeah, so... Um... So I, I'm not, so to start with the, the question about SEO on TikTok, I'm not as well, I'm, I'm not really um, familiar with how the TikTok um, algorithm works. And, um, you know, what I, I can speak more broadly about how news organizations typically work with uh, things like SEO and trending topics is I think that you're seeing more of a relationship, I think a healthier relationship being formed with audience teams and, and editorial teams when discussing the news agenda in that I don't think, you know, I don't think it's healthy for, you know, necessarily a news organization to look at whatever's trending and try to write a bunch of stuff or make a bunch of videos around that topic. It's kind of that kind of knee jerk it certainly works a lot less with video because it takes a lot longer. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's necessarily healthy to not pay attention to what the audience are interested in on your platforms um, and or to understand the kind of target audience you're reaching. And so I think, you know, just more broadly when it comes to, um, you know, setting the news agenda around that kind of stuff, I think it's, it is becoming more of a collaboration, I think, with, with amongst, those teams um, and where, you know, the editorial mission and is still the guiding light, um, but there's a lot more awareness of those. So uh, how do you make a politics video work for an audience that is interested in, um, 
you know, on TikTok that's primarily interested in food. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's, you know, a way to creatively figure that out in terms of the content you're making. But I think the, those conversations are starting to, you know, the conversations around how we can mer how we can understand what audiences are looking for and stick to our editorial mission. Are, there, there's a lot of those conversations happening in newsrooms. Um, in terms of, you know, the gentleman who's, who's running a podcast about entrepreneurship and trying to reach un people who are unemployed, I mean, you're, you're going for a very specific niche audience. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a couple ways, you know, instead of thinking about making your, your making videos that go viral, I think, you know, if you're talking about reaching a very specific audience, there's a number of things you can do depending on where you're publishing. But a lot of places have paid targeting and I don't know if you have a budget for that, but that's one thing that could be a really useful use of resources for your organization in particular, because you're, you can really like on YouTube, for example, you can, and you know, the, one thing that one trend on YouTube right now is a, there's a lot of people who are just posting their podcasts on YouTube or, or setting up a couple of cameras and just put, recording video of their podcast and putting it right on YouTube. With YouTube, you can then really target specific groups like, you know, um, I forget where, I'm sorry, I forgot where you were calling from, but uh, but you can, you know, you can, you can pick a specific region of a specific country, you can pick people who are, you know, who, who fit the demographic of what you're trying to reach. And if those people aren't on YouTube, I think one thing that's worth understanding is where are those people that you're trying to reach consuming their news and their media and try and then can and then carefully, uh, you know, uh, and then moving into that space um and you know and if if that's whatsapp or if that's um you know the the newspaper or if that's their local library for example like then you know there's it, it doesn't necessarily have to be if you're, you're if you're trying to target a very niche audience it doesn't necessarily have to be going to these big giant platforms to reach them there could be other ways um and then identifying audience needs uh, again, I think, you know, it's a, it's a really tricky, it depends if you're, you know, how big your existing audience is, but if you already have an established, you know, big, big audience and you're trying to better understand what they're looking for, then I think surveys are a really good way to do that. You can do that, if, you know, through newsletters, you can also solicit that on your website or in, you know, you can even do it through a video if you'd like, you know, you can conduct polls on, uh, all, all the social media platforms, I think. And so I think that asking your audience, you know, in a, there's, there's kind of a tactical way to do it, but I think asking your audience what they're interested in reading more of, or, or hearing more of, or if, if you have, you know, more open-ended questions, I think that can be really fruitful to understand what people are looking for. In addition to, paying close attention to the data um, and nothing compares to experimentation and trying stuff and seeing what's resonating with people. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's um, my recommendation on that. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And um, I think I will now take the probably last uh, batch of which submitted questions. Uh, two of them that I have together. So I'll ask you one after another. The first one is um, video is becoming more popular on LinkedIn. How do you see news organizations using LinkedIn to draw in audiences via video? And um, the second question, we see lots of videos on going viral on social media with millions of views, while some worth watching videos have a few views. What's the reason that less important videos get more views and engagement? That's like the question of my career. <laughs> That's the <laughs> eternal question. <laughs> um, I think uh, LinkedIn definitely, I mean, I didn't even talk about LinkedIn because I wasn't really sure where people were calling in from because it's, you know, it's not as big in other, in certain parts of the world, but it's a huge, um, 
place. You know, the thing with LinkedIn is it's very much obviously centered around, um, you know, jobs and careers and understanding um, and business. And so I think, you know, there's certain topics I think that do well in LinkedIn, but we, t- we publish on LinkedIn a lot and it's a really, I think it's a really good place for, you know, the, this kind of audience that we're going for um, at, um, at uh, Context, which is the platform that we're publishing um, our editorial coverage on at Thompson Reuters Foundation. And we have, you know, LinkedIn's uh, one thing that we're focusing a lot on. I think you can get, um, we, you're seeing a lot more, you know, a, a bigger, much bigger audiences on LinkedIn. And you're definitely seeing this, you know, you can definitely target audiences a lot better. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the question about why better videos don't do as well as, as some junk. I mean, it's like, I don't know the, the, like there's, there are kind of mindless ways to get people to watch a video. And I think they just, they, they, they tend to work sometimes. And I think, um, some some of these algorithms are just and the way that people and the way that you can be hooked into watching something are just really powerful and i think we're just we're still at that point in our relationship with the internet where i think like we can get easily there's a lot of there's a lot of garbage out there and um you know we can it's it can be easy to you know get somebody to watch something turn their brain off and watch something than it can be to ask somebody you know, scrolling through a news feed or on TikTok to really sit back and engage with something. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the optimistic side of me s- says that you know, there's there there will always be a space for for deep and uh, and really good and engaging content. And I think it's just. You know what we're seeing is the right now the prevalence of social social video that still, you know, it's it still mostly lends itself to stuff that's a little bit lighter. But you know, I think, um, I think that that's you know that that's constantly changing too. You know, I think and and so um, and will we ever compete with a sixty second? celebrity video or cat video probably not but um it doesn't mean that you know there isn't a place out there to to do really good videos that a lot of people watch okay yeah <laughs> so thank you thank you thank you very much for that. um so in 30 in 30 seconds uh what are your last remarks uh, what is your advice what do you think should be the take-home message uh, for our participants today i mean i would just say um you know, instead of trying to summarize all of that, I would just say um, anybody who's on this call, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to share my email address with the group or I can post it in the chat here. And I'm happy to, you know, answer fo- any follow-up questions. Um, and yeah, and and don't hesitate to reach out. And it's been a pleasure talking to all you guys and, and the questions were, were really thought-provoking and engaging. So thank you. Yes, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, please do endeavor to share the slides with me and I'm going to pass it on uh, to all attendees. And uh, our attendees, I also want to tell you that I know many people had a lot of questions regarding uh, TikTok. Uh, We are going to have a dedicated session uh, on TikTok uh, in the coming weeks. So please and please don't worry, we know TikTok is, uh, is on the buzz right now, so we are aware of this. So do look forward uh, to that session. And next week, uh, we are going to have um, uh, another high opening session. We'll be looking at deep fakes, uh, synthetic media, and uh, artificial intelligence. And um, so we are going to look at how to identify this and uh, work with uh, deep fakes, synthetic media, 
and uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, you really, really need to register uh, for that session. It's important for you to specifically register for each of these sessions. And uh, so I'm putting the link uh, to register for that session right now. Uh, it's in the chat box. Please do endeavor uh, to register uh, for that session. And um, this forum, uh, this session is being brought to you uh, in uh, I, the community manager that I run, uh, the forum that I run is known as the ICFJ's uh, Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. Uh, it's a Facebook forum, a closed forum for journalists, thousands of journalists uh, in different parts of the world. And we actively engage, share information, share insights, tools and resources, and of course, uh, opportunities. So I encourage you uh, to be part of this group. And uh, it's it's direct, just click the link I just put in the box. and. Um, yeah, you are going to be admitted uh, in the group. We share information in real time, uh, even long before uh, these uh, sessions get the information. And um, I also encourage you uh, to be on the lookout uh, in your emails. Uh, and of course, on ICFJ is a YouTube page uh, for videos of this. I know many are asking for videos of this session. It's being recorded and uh, in the next 24 hours, uh, it will be available on ICFJ is a YouTube page. But if you have playing back, of that uh, Facebook forum, uh, you are going to we are going to share the link directly uh, with you, and uh, we are really glad that you found this session uh, to be highly engaging. And uh, from your questions, it's quite obvious that the interest is there. The need is also there, and uh, I really want to appreciate Jacob uh, for taking time uh, to extensively answer all the questions. We've just right gone exactly one minute uh, beyond the ninety minute mark that uh, we plan for this and I wouldn't want to keep you on uh, longer than planned. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And on behalf of the ICFJ and uh, organizers and team behind the designing uh, the information of empowering the truth, uh, global summit that is happening in different languages and uh, attracting uh, journalists in different parts of the world and on different time zones. I say thank you very much for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye and uh, have a great day.